So my project, I mean, this is a part of my, my PhD, uh, which essentially looks at the concept of protection uh, for vulnerable populations. And I, and I have a lot of case studies in it, like large case studies. Uh, one of them, I start with the slave colonies uh, in British Trinidad, where I study uh, the institutionalization of protection for slaves. Uh, and then it moves to the West African protectorates and then the, the mandated territories of, uh, of Iraq. Now, I don't obviously compare the petitioners in any of these cases, although um, historians like Ernst Volgast has compared slaves to minorities and said that they're probably quite similar. I don't go that far. Um, but I do find, uh, in terms of the institutionalization, a lot of similarities in these various institutions that protected vulnerable populations, of which the mandate is, is one. And when studying such institutionalization of protection for vulnerable populations, petitioning, uh, which is called obviously different iterations in, in each of these institutions, becomes a very important part of how these vulnerable populations actually get protection. So in the slave colonies, it's extremely interesting as well. But given I've just been working on it for so long and I'm so tired of it, I thought, OK, I'm going to move on to my the next chapter, which I, these are all just my preliminary findings, so they're not um, very exhaustive. But I thought it could be interesting to, um, to test them out here. Now, I start with just a broad uh, overview of what the mandates really was, for those of you who don't know. Um, it was created under the ages of the League of Nations uh, after the First World War, and it was created under Article 22, specifically of the League of uh, Nations uh, Covenant. Now, the whole idea of the mandates was that it, it was meant to the Turkish and the German territories of the colonies were to be distributed to the victorious allies of the war. And um, the League of Nations was meant to help these territories develop. That was the, the whole, that was the mandate behind the mandate. Um, now there were three categories of these, uh, these mandates that I'm going to just briefly uh, tell you before I get into the, the juicy part. Um, now, the Class A mandates, uh, now all of these mandates were classified based on how developed they really were. Now, the Class A mandates were the Middle Eastern uh, Arab territories. Now, they were understood to be very close to independence, as in they were considered to be developed enough to be very close to independence. Uh, the Class B mandates were territories in uh, the African uh, continent, and they were, con they they were composed mainly of former German colonies in, in Africa, and uh, the administrator or the mandatory power was uh, to see to the protection and welfare of these populations. They were not considered to be close to uh, independence. And the last class of the mandates were um, territories in the southwest uh, Africa and the former German Pacific Islands they were regarded to be at such a low level of civilization that they could be ruled practically as parts of the mandatory power themselves. Now, the idea came to the Western victors, or the idea to internationalize protection. Now, the mandates are a very interesting uh, case study for me because I look at other forms of protection which were institutionalized in very different setups and this was the first kind of real internationalization of protection through the league that was uh, created and there was obviously a romanticism related to internationalism which I think it still exists today so the, the idea that internationalizing these territories or oh, sorry th this idea of protection would be beneficial um, for, for everybody and also would bring with it a kind of legitimacy that uh, the empire's um, ideas of protection did not. Um, now, I focus on the Class A mandates and the petitioning of the Class A mandates, which I find interesting for, for different reasons. One, the case of Iraq is perhaps understudied by international law scholars. Uh, perhaps it's been studied a lot by the anthropologists who are in this room who know of uh, very many studies, but it's not really been studied very much simply because Iraq was the first mandated territory to be emancipated. So it's considered less interesting in terms of the volume of work, etc., because right from the moment Iraq uh, 
became a mandate, they were already championing for emancipation. So that kind of makes it less interesting for people who really want to understand what the mandate was trying to do. Um, and Iraq is, again, an interesting country in terms of its demographic, because it was a majority Shiite population with a minority Sunni uh, population, which was divided into the Arabs and the Kurds. So I don't want to like give you the punchline, but as the story goes along, you figure that the majority was really not the one in power, right? I mean, we all know the, how the story went uh, to the present. Now, the mandated territory of Iraq as the story goes, uh, Britain seizes Baghdad during the First World War. The League of Nations approves uh, the British mandate. Uh, and then, now that 1921, what happens is the result of a conflict, a revolt, which is called the Glorious Iraqi Revolution, which happened in 1920. Now, this revolution is very interesting simply because it had the combined forces of the Sunnis and the Shias. They were fighting the British. They were fighting the administration of the British occupation of Iraq together as a combined force. Now, what Britain then does is it, it appoints a Hashemite prince, uh, Faisal, um, as the king and in, installs the Sunnis as the government in, in Iraq. So there are a lot of treaties that I won't get into. In, in 1922, a treaty was signed which allowed for the Sunnis to be in power and in return that the Britain would, would get obviously some, uh, some incentives. And it was the idea behind appointing a Sunni government was A, they wanted to find obviously a population that they thought they could control. They wanted a population that uh, was friendly to the British. And Faisal was one of them. The Hashemites were, one, uh, were the friendlier uh, parts of the, uh, of the Mesopotamian population. And in 32, the mandate ends and Iraq becomes independent. So this is kind of the, the chronology of events from um, that in between which the petitioning uh, really happens. Now, why petitioning? I mean, when did it come about? So it was not, it is not written in the League of Nations covenant. It, the League of Nations does not mention a provision for petitioning at all. Um, it came about in 1922 after there was um, a kind of revolt in, in the um, Bondelzwat, uh, the affair in Southwest Africa. Um, now, there were the group called the Khoi Khoi who were opposed to many of the British policies, and um, they were also opposed to the new administration by the British. And there was a lot of disagreement, but how it ended up with, I mean, despite a lot of violence, it ended up was the mandate or the League of Nations felt that even though the mandate is in place, there is no way to ensure that the mandatory power does not oppress the inhabitants. So the petitioning was um, a method to allow the inhabitants to make their complaints known to, the, um, to a body known as the Permanent Mandatory Commission. And that was a means for the PMC to keep a check on the excess of authority by the mandatory powers. So, they defined a petition system, so you don't have any, um, any mention of it in the, in the covenant. The Fourth Assembly kind of described what this meant. The, the description, again, to me, is very similar to what was said about the slave population. So there is that institutional similarity which I'm interested in. So it was to ameliorate the conditions of the natives, these really backward uh, people who do not know how to self-govern, we need to make their conditions better. And they are subjected to a kind of despotic or um, you know, cruel administrative uh, body within their territory that you have to protect them from. Now, the Fifth Assembly brought about the right to petition, started publicizing the mandatory reports, and also requested for responsible mandatory overseers in the Permanent uh, Mandatory Commission. Now, when you look at the petitions that were uh, put forth by the different populations, you find some interesting patterns. So you find that, for example, I looked at petitions from the Kurds. There were quite a few petitions, and this was kind of ranging um, in the latter, uh, latter part of, uh, of, their, of the British occupation. 
Now the Kurds wanted a separate territory, which I guess everybody knows the story. Um, and the response from the, uh, the PMC to the British was you have to protect the Kurdish minorities. But at the same time, there was also a very clear rec recognition of the Kurds being essentially tribal, being incapable of self-government. Uh, and then there was also the question of whether the, the Kurdish problem was really a minority question at all, because the Iraqis themselves did not think of the Kurds as being a minority, minority uh, force. So they said, what does it mean to be a minority? So that question also came up. Do you, does it mean you have to be subordinated for you to be called a minority? Is it, uh, or does it just mean in terms of numbers, you're a minority? But Iraq was a special case, because we're talking about a Shiite majority that was not in power, whereas it was a Sunni uh, minority that was in power. So what did it mean to be a minority uh, was a question that, that came up. And Humphreys, who was the British um, representative at the PMC, uh, said that, you know, it doesn't mean, it's being a minority does not imply insubordination. So we have to like stop thinking of it as being synonymous with each other. Now, another group that uh, filed a lot of petitions were the Baha'is. Now, they were more concerned about oppression by from the from the Shiites uh, in terms of you know seizure of their property uh, desecration of their sacred sites etc now the PMC's response to the um, the petition was to ask the Iraqi government of course to restore the property which didn't happen because nobody wanted to upset the Shiite majorities so the the Sunni government refused to uh, to actually um, accede to the request um, Another request was, I mean, I've just written the exact phrasing in the, in the response by the PMC, but they felt that Britain needs to control the Iraqis more. Like, you need to control the territory more, which is ironic, right? Because the whole idea of the petition was to, to prevent the excessive control by the mandatory powers. So it all kind of like turned up on its head. Um, and they said an injustice has been committed which could have been avoided had the mandatory power maintained more control. Now, so this is um, a question. So when you keep in mind the kind of petitions that were put forth, what does it really mean in terms of the petitioners? Who were they? What did it mean for international law? Right? This is my question. Now, and I'm interested in agency, so there's always a question of like, how were these vulnerable populations granted agency? And petitioning is an excellent example of demonstrating agency on part of the vulnerable populations. So this was one such case where international law, a field where only states were considered subjects, you have this, these new kind of these new groups of people who were also considered subjects. And these were the petitioners, the, man, the inhabitants of the mandates, the minorities, uh, et cetera. So there was that. And of course, it came with a large advantage of just the participation in an international forum, which did not exist until that point. It, it didn't exist under international law at all. Now, the third point is that what the petitions demonstrated as far as the inhabitants were is that there was a power that was beyond the mandatory power that they were, sub that they were uh, under. And the sovereignty of the league was higher than this respective authority. So they felt like they could be treated equally uh, when they got to that plane of the League of Nations where it didn't really matter whether you were the power or not. You both kind of had a kind of a standing because the higher law treated everybody equally. But um, let's not kid ourselves. Um, uh, so the other aspect of it, which is, you know, I look at the, the other aspect of what it really meant, this, this agency, is that the petitioners could not appear before the tribunal. And this is why I had asked the question earlier, because this is how I think of, of, of petitioning. The petitioners could send the petitions to the PMC, but the PMC would only call the mandatory power to sit in. Uh, and you know the hearing would be conducted with just the mandatory power. Now, for anybody who does law, this is just you know, flagrant violation of any kind of due process that uh, one, one studies. So there was clearly, I mean, it was not that they wanted to really give them a fair hearing. It was, 
merely to find strategies to assuage the, the fears of, uh, of the petitioners. Now, the advantage of participation was interesting and important, no doubt, but it also came with the risk of exposing your marginality, exposing the fact that you did not actually have uh, full autonomy simply because of the process. The process was set up in a way that the power struggle between the two people going to the PMC was just laid out very in bare terms. <coughs> and the last point which I, I made earlier is that you obviously have the league which does have sovereignty and which is above the mandatory power and above everybody else. But you found that what the league solution always entailed pushing the mandatory power to, to exercise more control. So it, um, it left questionable what, um, what the petitioning process really did for the, the vulnerable population. And so then, what did it really mean for the mandatory powers who were trying to make people's lives better and to civilize uh, all of these people. And I found this great cartoon where they say that, you know, they're just sowing the seeds for war. I mean, it's really what they did. They came up with the idea in response to a rebellion and the revolution that had happened. But what they really did was to sow the seeds for more wars and more revolutions that happened later. And of course, the part of my project that um, is really um, trying to look at is another aspect, which is like, what was it that Iraq, um, what was it that Britain was really trying to do when they, when they went to Iraq? And of course, most of the narratives talk about the civilizational process, uh, this whole barbaric, uh, the, bar the barbarians versus the civilized, the dichotomy that is often used uh, in many of these, uh, uh, these paperwork that you see of the Mandate Commission. But I mean, Britain was extremely um, pushing, was pushing very hard for Iraq to be um, emancipated. And there was a reason for that. And the reason for that is, well, <laughs> oil. So, so the, the material interest that Britain had in Iraq was, was largely um, kind of trumped everything else that happened. So when we think of the man mandate, when we think of, um, uh, of the processes that the League of Nations Covenant put down, what, is, what often goes understudied and perhaps like in the shadows is the real material interest and the economic um, interest that they were really uh, pushed by. Thank you. <laughs>